Hello everyone, my name is Samantha Laranjo and I will be your moderator for today's webinar on how to optimize your prototype for high volume PCB manufacturing. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar and introduce you to our presenters, Steve Bray and Orlin Bates. Steve has been in the PCB and EMS industry for more than 20 years, having held executive positions in engineering, operations, quality, and supply chain. The early part of his career, he worked in Europe and Asia. Steve holds a fellowship with the Institute of Circuit Technology and is a contributing member of High Density Interconnect Group and regularly consults with IPC subcommittee teams on emerging and diverging technologies. Orlin has been in the field of PCB design for 43 years and has been with EMA for over 16 years. Orlin attended vocational tech school, earning a degree in drafting and design technologies. With many years of printed circuit, wire board design, and DFM knowledge, Orlin is a highly skilled professional in the field of engineering design. We also have joining us today, Mike Sexton, sales manager at Sierra Circuits, available to answer high volume fabrication questions. Steve will start off the webinar with information on today's topic. Assuming we have time at the end, we will field some questions in a formal Q&A. Thank you for your attention. And now over to you, Steve. Marvelous. Thank you, Samantha. Thanks for that kind introduction. And welcome and good morning to all the participants. Um, Samantha, can everybody see my screen and hear me OK? Yes, you're good. Marvellous. OK, so uh, we're going to cover, you know, quite a few subjects this morning. Uh, we also have all in my colleague will come in at the end and he's actually going to demonstrate some of the online software tools which we have. Um, as Samantha said in the introduction, you know, please feel free to, you know, ask any questions online real time as I go through the presentation and we'll have a Q&A at the end if, if there's time permitting. Um, if we don't get a chance to answer any of your questions, we will follow up afterwards and we'll send them out after the presentation. Okay. So what does a designer need to know about high volume production? So when within the circuit board industry, we have different types of, of, of manufacturing and, you know, small, medium, large volume means something different to different people. Within our organization, we class small volume as, you know, sub 50 panels and a production panel being typically 18 by 24 inches in, in area. Anything 50 panels plus be below, uh, between 50 and 100, we would class as medium, and then anything above 100 panels, we would class as you know, high production for us. Now, obviously that's not high production, you know, as compared to, for example, the automotive industry where you know, they may be producing hundreds of thousands of, of units per day. Um, but in the type of environment which we operate in, in the high regulatory environment with aerospace and defense and, you know, the other sectors which we support, you know, this is what we're terming small, medium and large volume production for the purpose of today's webinar. So, you know, the features or the, the benefits that we get from high volume production uh, are, you know, cost efficiencies, uh, obviously, obviously being able to leverage economies of scale, time saving, uh, obviously with having a prototype shop and then taking it seamlessly through prototype into medium or mass production, then we've got the, uh, you know, obviously the time saving aspect and, you know, helps the customer to get their product to market quicker. Um, high product consistency. Uh, obviously, the larger the volume, the more process control that we can put in place and the more we can learn from the production and, 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 and increase the efficiency and the overall effectiveness of that process. And then ultimately, you know, a lower production cycle. So what is the importance of efficient prototyping? So within the prototype space, 70% of the design costs are typically locked in at this early stage. You know, when we look at design and a, a, a PCB or, or an assembly, we look at the materials, we look at the real estate, we look at the, you know, the mechanical functionality requirements of the product and the electrical requirements of the product. And they're all, always designed in at that early P1, P2, P3 stage build. Now, once the production cycle commences, we can still make changes. We can still, you know, have some form of optimization, but generally it's to do with real estate, surface finishes, or minor changes. Um, you know, you can, you can obviously drive efficiencies at that stage, but, you know, most of the low hanging fruit, if you like, is in that early prototyping stage. Um, 
for a successful prototype, we really want to try and reduce the design complexities. Um, we want to make a product which is transferable and um, which is built to IPC or to you know the, the correct regulatory requirements. And it meets all the design requirements of the customer. Uh, but ultimately, you know, form, fit, function, and the testing of that device is all really done at the prototype stage. And what we really want to have as an output from the prototype is a product delivered you know, on time to a place of our customers choosing at a fair and reasonable price. But we really want to use that prototype and stage to iron out all of the all of the bugs. You know, any design iterations, any modifications as we go through the P1, P2, the P3 cycles, so that when the product does go into mainstream production, it's gonna it's gonna run very, very efficiently. So some of the design the challenges in high volume production. So building thousands of boards and then realizing they're not operational. So many times I've seen this, you know, in a in a typical you know PCB manufacturing operation. You know, they, they will do everything in the same process. So they will take their mass production facility and they will try and run a prototype through it, you know, maybe in a, in a, in a faster time than a you know, normal standard production. Um, but within these scenarios, if you don't go through the P1, P2, P3 and, you know, really use that as a chance to, you know, bring the board to maturity, then you can end up building thousands of products before you actually get them into the, you know, the testing part of the design cycle and only to realize that they're either not operational or, you know, not as efficient as we thought. There's also the increased costs that would come with that due to multiple respins and, you know, poor yield if it hasn't been designed to manufacture correctly. And then obviously production delays and, and, and you know, material delays due to, you know, component availability should it be a constrained market, which is, you know, what we've just come out of for the last two to three years. So here within Sierra, we really offer this, you know, virtually integrated solution. Um, so we, we obviously have our prototype facilities, we have our medium and mass production facilities through PCB fabrication, but then we also have our assembly and, and testing facilities and our component procurement facilities too. So by, you know, by teaming up with Sierra, you know, it helps you to find the right manufacturer right at that early stage, who's capable not only of bringing your prototypes to market, but also enabling that seamless transition into the large production uh, environment using the same equipment and processes. It stops you or eliminates the need to do, you know, further qualifications. Um, engaging with our teams to discuss any material and procurement, uh, component procurement uh, requirements is key too. Um, obviously in a prototype shop, you know, we don't have the luxury of being able to take three, five, ten weeks to, you know, manufacture things. Um, you know, from really engaging with the designer to ship an assembled product, we're really talking deals here within Sierra. So it's important that we have this virtual integration. Um, being well versed with the DFM and the DFX guidelines is, is very, very helpful too. Um, and then obviously going through the, um, you know, the contract review process and the documentation review process helps us to raise any, you know, technical or engineering queries at that early stage and make sure when we do launch into production, it's right first time. Um, we also decide the volume requirements at that point so that we can, you know, tool onto our um, production panel sizes. Our standard sizes are 18 by 24, but we do do various other options too, and um, based on you know material utilizations. And then our team of you know software, hardware, and design engineers can really help work with your design teams to modify the designs accordingly should there be some iterations that are required. So identifying the right manufacturer is really, really key. Um, I'm just going to leave this here as a, as a graphic that you can read later. I don't want to go too much into it. But it really starts with the manufacturer's capabilities, understanding what they are, you know, understanding the company, how are they managing the supply chain, what sort of certifications they have, you know, what type of technical um, you know, capabilities they have. But these are really all of the key stages which we deem to be important uh, in choosing the right manufacturer from the get go. Specialized equipment for high volume production. Um, within Sierra, um, you know, obviously we have unique equipment sets. Um, the whole industry works on 18 by 24 inch panels, but in a prototype shop, you know, we've got to think of time. So we think of things like, you know, how many setups would we need to do with the, you know, these standard types of, um, you know, equipment uh, sets. So within our facility, it's slightly different. We do use the same equipment sets, but we tend to have 
large baths, large beds and things like this so that, you know, we can have exactly the same electrical, mechanical and functional performance from our prototype process, you know, is the same from our um, mass production process. Um, one of my colleagues, Steve Dutton, who's the director of our aerospace and defence sector, you know, explained this a little bit more succinctly in, you know, specifically to plate and baths. Uh, you know, a small volume bath, if you like, can create exothermic heat in certain areas and you have less flow around them tanks so that you can have, you know, problems or localised issues, you know, just based off the equipment um, sets. By using larger tanks, you know, we can put things in there such as, you know, vibration, ultrasonics, and, you know, we can have really good flow systems within our tanks to help us get a, a product, a better product out to the, you know, out to the customer. It also, within our assembly process, you know, we have the latest state-of-the-art kit and place machines, reflows with nitrogen, and automatic testing equipment. Again, it's designed to um, minimize the, the time through the prototype stage, but also to help with aiding in efficiency and capacity and constraints, constraints as we go into mass production. So very unique equipment sets here. They are based off industry standard, but then they're modified to the type of business which we which we do here in, in Sierra. So some of the uh, some of the slides that I'm going to kind of go through a little bit quickly because, as I said, Ollie and my colleague is going to do a demonstration at the end of some of the on-rest software tools, and, and we'll cover these. But really, you know, what the, the, the takeaway from this slide is, you know, right up at that, you know, early beginnings. This is some of the critical data which we require so that we can, you know, launch into production quicker. So, you know, type of technology, whether it's HDI, Flex, Flex Rigid, is it a microelectronic type of technology? These things really help us to determine, you know, which facility, which process, which equipment sets, which we should use within our, uh, within our facility. Stack up details are critical. You know, number of layers, the material, you know, the layer order, the copper weights, all of these things, again, you know, help us with, within our manufacturing. And, you know, we can really engage with you early on here because we can help you to drive some of the costs out of your design. An example I like to use here is that, you know, the designers always like to put, you know, double and triple ply constructions into their designs. Uh, you know, thinking about dielectric separation, you know, resin to glass uh, ratios and things like this. But, you know, from a cost perspective, you know, each sheet of prepreg or each layer that you put in there, you know, can be up to 15% of the overall cost of that design. So, you know, we can really help at that early stage by maybe suggesting instead of a triple ply construction, why don't you go to, for example, a larger or a thicker core and try this prepreg instead. And again, there's a lot of, you know, engineering uh, interface that we can have at that early stage. Other information, you know, surface features, you know, surface finish type materials, you know, what kind of requirements you need. Is it IPC, grade two, grade three, is it mill grade, mill spec, what kind of UL requirements? All of these things really help us choose our material sets process and ensure that the product that we send to you is, is to, you know, fit for purpose. Some of the cost drivers within board manufacturing, you know, I, I, I started earlier by mentioning that up to 70% of the design costs uh, you know, uh, uh, taken in at that uh, very early P1 design stage. And um, some of the things that can contribute to that are board and panel size, real estate. Uh, obviously, you know, we within the industry, we go to something called square inch pricing. So, you know, we look at the real estate on that board and we charge, you know, the customer a fixed price per square inch. Now, if that material is not very well utilized, for example, if we've got a small circuit in a large area with a lot of waste, then you know, the customer is ultimately playing for, you know, the snap off or the, or the waste, which ends up going, you know, into reclaim or scrap. So one of the things that we like to do here at Sierra is aim for 85% material utilization on both the customer's array and also on our production panels. And then that way we can really optimize, you know, our, our production panels and we can use the, you know, the excess for tooling and coupons and things like this. Um, but you'd be surprised at how many designs I see come through with a tiny circuit and a large array. And, you know, if I question the customer over this, you know, they may say, well, you know, within our assembly operation, we want to optimize our board size for efficiency. And, you know, they may get a one, two percent efficiency improvement within their assembly process. But it's at the detriment of maybe a 20, 30, 40 percent cost increase on the array because of the uh, material utilization. Adding layers to the stack. Again, sometimes it's better to, you know, miniaturize the design feature 
and reduce the number of layers than it is to you know keep adding you know RF and dielectric layers and ground layers and etc. So you know a lot of the time engaging early, we can really help to you know give the designers some options. Uh, hey, have you thought of maybe design it like this? You can take two layers out and you get the same mechanical and electrical uh, functionality at the end of the day. Uh, some other things to consider a number of drills and the drill sizes. You know, there's a lot of industry standards here. So 0.3 millimeter is a drill diameter and um, is standard. So with a 0.3 millimeter drill diameter, we can drill three high or two high. And, you know, we can get some, some optimization within our drill process. When we go below 0.3 millimeters, then you know we we have to reduce the stack height because if we try and drill three high with a 0.2 millimeter drill, for example, we'll get a lot of snaps. So you know something something as small as a drill diameter can increase the or reduce the cost of the product by you know as much as 20% in some cases. Um, other things to consider are things like micro vias and stacked vias because we need to sequentially laminate these. And when you sequentially laminate, it adds, you know, four or five days onto the cycle time. Um, so again, you know, where possible, we try not to stack or bury vias. But if it's a design requirement, then, you know, obviously it's a, it's a design requirement and we can absolutely do that within our capabilities. There's a lot of other issues, uh, other, other items as well to, you know, take into consideration with respect to board drivers and cost drivers. Um, but we can cover that later on in the in the demos. So some just some very good cost saving tips here is uh, just ensure maximum material utilization as we've already covered. Try and reduce the real estate as much as possible and minimize the number of components. Uh, make sure that your contract manufacturer has uh, vendor managed risk inventory systems. You know one of the biggest issues that I see at the moment is uh, companies accepting orders only to you know delay for three four five months because of a component shortage um, now here within sierra at any point in time we're always stocking you know 10 million dollars worth of inventory and you know 85 percent of all of the components that we use are either on a you know a vendor managed inventory program where we have immediate access to them or we're actually stocking them in house so you know this can be key when you know you're asking the same vendor to manufacture the product and also do the assembly as well. Um, other things is you know testing uh, EOI, SPI, and AVX. Um, you know these are critical in cost saving. Um, if we can get really good test coverage, um, ODB plus fluid files or functional test files, that really helps us to hone that process in and make sure that the product is is optimized. So some of the factors that affect lead time is the technology type. You know, I think we already covered that micro vias, via and pads. Some of these technologies that require sequentially laminating take longer to go through the process. And um, special materials such as Duroid or Rogers can have specialized uh, drilling requirements, as can materials such as PTFE. You know, basically we have to slow the drills down because the material melts and it coagulates around the drills. So, you know, as soon as we see exotic materials such as Rogers, PTFEs, Arlons, you know, tetrafluorocarbons, some of these types of material sets, then we really have to start slowing the process down. And um, the unavailability of components is obviously going to affect lead time too. Uh, inaccurate data files, you know, how many times do we see the technical query or the EQTQ bouncing backwards and forwards? You know, that can go on for days and days and days. What we've done here in Sierra is we've automated and scripted that as much as possible. So our online systems basically have all of the you know IPC design requirements built in, and you know when you upload your your information, as Oli and my colleague will take you through at the end of this presentation, it's going to do an automatic DRC check and immediately pull out anything that's going to affect lead time or anything that is potentially going to be a capability issue. Um, and then the other uh, issue to you know consider is the manufacturing capacity of the fab house. You know we are in a constrained market where the usual suspects have lead times pushed out to you know 30, 40 weeks, and you know a, a prototype in their environment might be six weeks. Um, you know obviously that doesn't really help to get your product to market you know in time or in front of your competition. Um, so that can be a, a real issue in a constrained market. The actual available capacity of the fab houses. That becomes more of an issue when you look at, you know, ITAR type products, you know, air, aerospace and defense type products, because again, you know, that then limits the available supply chain. 
Okay, so uh, component procurement and best practices. I'm really just going to skip over this slide because we're going to take you through a demo on this. But there's some guidelines here which really just helps the assembly operation in placement and optimization of that placement. Things like part to edge clearance and keep out zones. Um, I'll just let you take this as, as a readout. And uh, if there's any questions on this later, you know, we can follow. Um, for our assembly operation, then, you know, design for automation can really be critical. So, you know, some of the things that we would like to suggest to our customers is choose press fit components with consistent dimensions. Um, you know, the amount of designs that I see that have five or six different fasteners all really doing, you know, the same end job. But what it means is I now have to load, you know, six or seven different locations within the assembly machines. You know, the, the, the head, if you like, has to start, you know, picking and placing these components. We suffer from attrition, you know, of the components. So, you know, there's a lot we can do there to really just try and minimize, you know, the churn, if you like, within the pick and place process. Um, using self-aligning and self-locating features such as guide pins, dimples and chamfers is, is very helpful as well. Um, please bear in mind also that you know the components that you're selecting for the design need to be able to withstand the uh, insertion forces that we apply during uh, during assembly. So again, you know a lot of the software that we have online will look at the components that you're selecting or choosing, and it will give that feedback as to say, hey, this is a device which is known for you know mechanical um, you know crack or mechanical creep failures, you know due to insertion forces, and you'll get that feedback real time. And then, you know, the next thing really is just opt for SMD or surface mount components over through hole. You know, even in today's modern age, you know, through hole is still quite a labor intensive process. You know, there's preforming of components are required. There's, you know, there's either wave or hand soldering depending on the features and things like this. So where possible, we prefer to do surface mount, but, you know, that's not always the, the you know, a design there. That, that's not always something that we can do just because of the design requirements of the customer. Okay, so this is a uh, this is a snapshot of the online bomb checker tool. Um, Olion will give a demo of this, as I said at the end of the presentation. But you know, in a snapshot, you can basically upload your bomb to our online tools, and it's going to go through real time. It's going to check the components. It's going to check you know reference designators. It's going to look for any mismatches, and it's going to give you real time uh, feedback. Okay, so PCBs in the high volume production. So, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier on, you know, what we see here in this photograph is what we call a PCB array. So the little white circles you see are the actual circuit boards or the units. And then the array is just how are they, how they are configured into the, you know, into the, into the panel. Now, the more circuits that we can put into array, then the more we can optimize it, the more utilization we can get, the lower the cost. But there are things to consider. You know, if uh, if one of these units, for example, becomes defective, then, you know, you've got two choices. You can either X that one out and populate the rest of them, knowing that you're now running at a, an inefficiency, or you can say, no, I don't want to accept any X outs, and then ultimately the rest of that panel would end up getting scrapped along with the one defective circuit. There's pros and cons to both. There's no right or wrong. Um, it's really just something that should be discussed and, and agreed at the front end. Now, my take on this is that with the modern machinery that you know companies have within their assembly processes, they can decide where and when not to pick and place components. Um, but that heat needs to go somewhere. So you know if components are not being placed on one particular circuit in this array, then that heat is being dissipated amongst the other circuits, and that can have you know reliability issues further down the line. So you know there is some takeaways from this, but again. You know, our design team will work with your designers up front to really talk about that. Um, and then the only other thing to consider really here is, is you know, how you really want to, you know, process these. Is a two up or a four up or six, a eight up or ten up? You know, again, I said, every you know, every single design has pros and cons. Um, you know, really we're trying to reduce real estate and create efficiency by doing this optimization. But it is also possible for us to route all of these out and ship these in circuit form. So again, the takeaway from this, there's no right or wrong. But you know, when you're you know, when you're putting product into arrays, then it's really it's about real estate, it's about material utilization, and then it's really about the efficiency of the process going forward. And um, selecting the right panel size can be key. 
Um, typically, we run on an 18 by 24 inch panel, but you know the size of your production area is entirely you know dependent upon the customer. There, there is some requirements such as you know minimum space between circuits. You know if we're going to route them or if we're going to go to, for example, a V score. You know what their minimum dimensions would be, and then there's obviously design constraints too, such as if you have um, you know connectors which overhang the edge of, edge of the board, or if there's any you know edge gold plating requirements. These can affect, you know, the array, if you like. Um, but what we really try to advise here is, you know, try and keep things, um, you know, square or oblong. Odd short, odd, odd shaped PCBs really, you know, hammer us on on material utilization. It's hard to process them. You know, if you've got weird, if you've got sort of strange shaped circuits like this, then processing chemistries can skip across tracks, and you know, you can get a differential etching, for example, between one circuit and the next. So what we really try to advise here is try and best you can keep your circuit uniform and try and keep the traces going in the same direction. It just helps with uh, process and registration and things like this. So the necessity of the DFM and the DFA. So they really ensure you know design and fabrication compatibility. You know we're looking for problems. Um, um, there's, there's half a dozen problems that are put up on here, but typically what we see is acid traps. Um, you know, starved thermals, insufficient annular rings for processing, insufficient copper and edge clearance. So, you know, you end up getting sort of skip plating and things like this. Absence of clearances on pad. These are just really some of the things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, when we typically design a product, we design it for its electrical or its mechanical functionality. We don't really think about, you know, the processing of that product as it goes to the manufacturing facility. Um, to give an example, a lot of the time I see a complex design, maybe a, a, a differential impedance requirement where they, the customer may have a um, two mil trace and gap on one side of the PCB. He might have four mil trace and gap on the other. Now, you know, the, the clever thing to do is to process that upside down so that the complicated side is constantly getting replenished with etch. Now, um, if you don't do this and you process it the other way, then you can get etch acid traps or etch puddles where you're either going to get concentrated chemistry or you're going to get weak chemistry and it can have a you know serious impact on the on on the uh, overall quality and reliability of, of, of that unit. These are the things that we would typically pick up in a design for manufacturer review or a design for assembly review. There's a lot more to it than what we've got on this slide, and, and uh, my colleague Olihan will discuss more at the end of the presentation. But you know, just to give a snapshot here, this is really what the you know the purpose of the DFM and the DFA is all about. Uh, obviously, we have manufacturing tolerances that we need to take into consideration. Just to give you a few, without spending too much time, you know, typically the materials which we procure come with a plus or minus ten percent tolerance. So you know, we have a material we're going to construct a PCB with, and overall, it's got a finished thickness tolerance of ten percent. But if we look a little bit further, if we look at the etch requirements from the IPC, the IPC allows a 20% um, tolerance on the finished copper, you know, depending on the IPC class. You know, and then things like solder mask has a tolerance, the prepreg has a tolerance. When you add them all up, you know, it seems like you can't build a, a fab. Now, what we actually do is we use geometric, um, geometric tolerance and within the process so that we can actually, this all comes out at the end and it works. But one of the things that I like to mention here is the amount of times I see an impedance requirement of you know so many ohms with a five percent tolerance, yet the the construction of the of the fab itself is only leading to a ten percent tolerance. So sometimes you have this mix match, right? But that's why it's important to really understand the tolerances. Some of the other tolerances are things like drill wonder, true positional accuracy. You know the ability for any CNC machine to place a hole where it should be at best is 50 microns or two mil. And, you know, that's for, you know, a bunch of reasons. But, you know, if that's the case, then sometimes I might see a, a requirement come through where, you know, it's a, it's a certain diameter drill with a certain diameter, you know, pad clearance or minimum annual land around that pad. But if I take into account that the machine only has true positional tolerance of two mil, then, you know, best case scenario, I'm gonna get tangency or break out on that design. So this is really why, you know, understanding the tolerances, the geometric tolerance, and then how all these tolerances play with each other is key to, you know, being able to manufacture a robust circuit board. But again, these are the things that we've scripted that are within our software tools, which Olion will demo later. 
So, you know, what crucial information do designers always miss? So again, I'm going to go back to Steve Dutton, our VP for Aerospace and Defense. Steve used to run a, you know, a couple of uh, PCB shops in his time. But, you know, really the feedback that he gave to me is that in the prototype production stages, they're different. And most of the time, tight tracks and gaps, sharp corners, closed pads, isolated pads, you know, things like this get missed at the prototype stage. You know, really in a prototype stage, you're really just trying to, you know, prove the design. So a lot of these things like sharp corners, we can manage them and we can produce the, the fabrications. Now within Sierra, we, we would spot this at the beginning and we would make sure that the prototypes were built to the same uh, you know, design specification as, as, as you know, the, the, the mass production boards. But if you're not using the, you know, an integrated um, facility, then what happens is the prototype shop just builds the prototypes and says, there you go, you know, we're good. And then you transfer that, the customer transfers that design to the mass production facility and suddenly they're saying, hey, we can't build this. You know, we don't have the capability to do this track and gap. These sharp corners are going to, you know, be prone to handling damage within the process. You know, this pad to copper issue is going to cause, you know, this problem. So, you know, these are really some of the issues that the prototypes are not designed the same way as the mass production. Because, you know, the gentleman or the designer that's designed is really just trying to say, is this electrically, you know, and functionally going to give me what I need? Um, you know, again, so that's one of the benefits really there of having your prototype and mass production within the same facility. Uh, okay, so this is just a snapshot of the uh, software, our online tools, um, where you can upload your information and, uh, you know, your Gerber files or, you know, your ODB++ files. And this is really going to uh, help you to identify any possible problems before you even start to you know, raise POs and things like this. So testing large volumes of PCBs. Uh, obviously, test is critical. And the more tests we have, the better that we can emulate the you know, functionality of your requirements. As a minimum, we have automatic optical systems all the way through our process. My, my apologies, it skipped a slide there. And um, so, you know, when we screen print, we have SPI, which is an EOI machine after screen print. When we, uh, when we assemble or do the pick and place, we'll have EOI, we'll have X-ray inspection, we'll have ICT tests doing isolation and continuity. We'll then have functional tests as well if we have the ODB++ and if we have the test rigs. And uh, we can measure isolation, continuity, impedance, we can do low ohm testing, you know, pretty much most of the requirements of a, of a modern assembly and fabrication house. And then uh, the latest uh, equipment that we've started to install throughout our facility is what we call AV EXI and AVX machines. So the product is becoming so complicated now that it's becoming extremely difficult for the human to, you know, discern it between, for example, an IBC class two and an IBC class three. So our latest investment has been in automatic vision equipment, which we use for final inspection. And uh, that complements our operators. Um, but again, within a modern environment, you know, we've really got to think about, you know, uh, seamless integration of, of our test solution into the manufacturing process. So some of the documentation which we require, and this is not a holistic list, but data files, Gerber files, ODB++, IPC 2581, whatever you've got. The more information you have, the better it helps us. If you've got net lists, wonderful, you know, fab drawn schematics, any notes that you may have drill files, net lists, uh, if there's any impedance requirements, if there's been any field solver type analysis done, you know, we can, we, we really could do with that information. If you don't have it, it's not a showstopper because we have also emulated all of these online tools. So if you're using our system, you can go in, you can generate your own net lists, you can go in, you can generate your own field solver equations. You know, it's all there for, for, for you to use. We need to know the bond. Uh, that really helps my supply chain team to get a head start and really to you know start bringing the components in or check on any long lead time requirements and then production quantities and deadlines you know so that we can that helps with the schedule and the planning throughout our production facility um this is just a very standard or typical fab drawing which would come in you know typically they would have the fab details down the left right maybe there's a stack up if it's a controlled build if not then we just say you know free build any uh, ibc requirements any you know surface feature requirements things like this um i'm really just going to leave this for you to have a look at after the presentation and this is just a very atypical type of fab drawing that we would get through but it is important you know, because sometimes we have conflict in data, you know, we have a purchase order asking for something, we have a fab drawing asking for something else, and then we have a specification asking for something else. 
and you get into this battle of the documents, right? Which one's correct? Is it the PO? Is it the fab drawing? Is it the specification? So, you know, what we ask for is all three. And then, you know, we obviously have an order of precedence that we follow, which is, you know, if you're just based off our of ISO rules. But if we don't get this, then really, you know, a lot of the time, all we really have to work off is the is the works order or the, or the purchase order. Uh, it's exactly the same for assembly. So, you know, if we if Sierra is going to do the assembly as well, then, you know, some certain information that we require as a minimum. We also want the ODB++ files because we want to, you know, emulate your functional test so that we not only do an isolation and continuity and x-ray, we're also doing a full functional test if possible. Um, if you've got pick and place files, that really helps us fill in materials we've already covered. Uh, whatever standard that we're working to, IPC, uh, any specific mounting instructions for, you know, some of these hand assembled components. And then, you know, if there's any, you know, do not insert type requirements, i.e. if there's a known component shortage and you don't want us to insert a component in a certain location, then we need to know that, right? What are the, what are the missing reference designators, if any? So the benefits of choosing an integrated or virtually integrated house such as Sierra. So we can efficiently scale from prototype to mass production. You know, there's, we're using the same equipment sets, the same process procedures, et cetera. So you don't need to go through, you know, that design iteration a second time. It also eliminates what we call design login. You know, the amount of times that prototype shop or, uh, you know, one of our competitors will, yeah, we can design your board for you, right? And that's great. You know, they make everything available. You design a wonderful product, but the moment you try and transfer, you know, the next fab shop person will say, hey, I can't build this, right? Because it's been designed to fit, you know, the previous uh, person's uh, manufacturing capabilities, you know? Um, so what we do is within our integrated facility, we design for transferability. So, you know, if you decide you, you want to place all of this business with Sierra, wonderful. You know, we can take that on. We would love to support you. If you decide for whatever reason that you want to offshore this to a low cost geography or something like this, then, you know, the product that we've designed is completely transferable to the correct IPC requirements. Um, it's a single point of contact for engineering and sales queries. You know, you're not making relationships and then having to, you know, do it all over again. Um, you know, the MPI or the new product in production stage and CAM processes, we can kind of fast track through them because we've already done the P1, P2 goals. And it also avoids any miscommunication because there's no follow up with multiple vendors. So these are really just some of the pros and, you know, pros of, of having a single point of contact. A um, couple of slides on supply chain now. Obviously, with Sierra, it's been virtually integrated. You know, we not only have fab assembly and a uh, and component procurement, we also have a supply chain team in place, which is, you know, consistently going out there and, and checking financial risks, natural disaster risks, cyber risks, you know, reputation and, you know, brand damage type of risks. So we're really trying to protect the customer and also to protect ourselves here. And we have a team of professionals with, uh, you know, all of the relevant, you know, software things where, you know, we can at any point in time, check all of our suppliers, distributors, you know, all of our customers, and we really like to, you know, really just to control the supply chain. Uh, and that really leads on to supply chain resilience as well. So, you know, being able to diversify the reverse procurement, you know, thinking about supply chain team as an extension of your own. So we have economies of scale. We can leverage that, maybe bring smaller or short component cycle times and pricing. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of experience in this field, too. So, you know, we can go direct to manufacturers and maybe get, you know, supply that other people can't get hold of. Uh, we have a strong recovery plan. So should something happen, you know, we have multiple facilities doing the same thing. So, you know, again, you know, we can ensure continuity of supply. Um, if there's any network issues, we can help out there. And, you know, really it's, you know, what the real takeaway here is it's an open and transparent process. And at this point, I'd like to thank you all for, you know, allowing me to present out to you today. And I'd like over to hand, hand over to my colleague, Olio. All right. We're talking about high volume manufacturing. And uh, I've been in this business for 50 years this year. And I've been with EMA for 21 years. During that time, I was CAD manager at Jabel Circuits. And when we had high volume, sometimes we ran 60,000 boards a shift through that plant. Uh, one thing I learned going down, talking to the people who actually got to build the product is where you'll learn the most. And here's some of the things that they had pointed out. So for instance, here's a design, placement's done. First thing I want to do, go in there. I'm going to move out of the command down in the lower left corner. I'm going to go into what's called skill. 
that skill programming uh, allows you to write skill programs to run certain features. In this particular one, I have a, uh, a program that I would run, and I want to do a device count on there. What it's going to do is give me a report, and this report's going to tell me where the parts are at, whether they're uh, the device type that I have, whether it's on the top or whether it's on the bottom, and I can come down through here and look and see that I have some parts here. Here's two parts of this resistor on the top, two parts on the bottom. Next, I got some inductors, four on the top, or yeah, four on the top, two on the bottom. Up here, I've got a resistor, nine on the top, six on the bottom. So what that gives me the benefit to do, if I wanted to come in here now, and I can come in here to decide that I'm going to highlight those parts, I want to look at those. I want to come in, I'm going to highlight, and I'm going to come over here under Find. I will change that to device type and put in my device type that I'm looking for. It's going to identify those parts. I've got two on the bottom and two on the top. If I would replace this and put them all on the top, what you're saving in the assembly process is that tape and reel machine, having to have a tape and reel for these parts, both for the top placement, both for the bottom placement. The throughput through your assembly is just incredible by making that minor type of change. It, it is very beneficial and it does save a lot of time in that. So I can come in here now and I could go in there. Remember there was one reporting to us where it had uh, six, I believe it was six on the top and the rest were on the bottom. So I'll come back down and I'll put that other device type in and look for those. Let's zoom out. There we go. There it is. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in to this area. And you can see all those components, of course, perfect. Here's, they're on the back side. There's plenty of room on this design. You might not have it. And of course, that's the, the restrictions you would have in your design. But there's plenty of room here to move those to the top. Uh, up here, I've got one on the top, one on the bottom. This is Going to the clock signal, we want it on the top so we can do a direct shoot in uh, from that into the IC. There's no reason why I couldn't flip that and bring that to the top. So if I could move all these parts to the top, again, you're saving time in assembly. And in a uh, manufacturing process where you got high volume, that is quite a bit of savings uh, time through assembly. That cost is just passed on to you. So it's very beneficial for you to go ahead and take advantage of that on there. Let's go ahead and do a fit view. I'm back here now. The next important thing, of course, would be stack up. So let's go ahead and look at the stack up. And Steve had actually talked about the fact that uh, in the stack up, you've got your core material. That's what's purchased. You can't really change that. They're purchasing that from a manufacturer. Uh, Rogers, GTEC, those type of uh, uh, panels. So we can come in here and you can't really do anything with the dielectric. So if top and ground is my core and inner one and inner two is a core, the only dielectric that I can uh, grow is, or shrink for that matter, would be in my ground to uh, N1 or N2 to ground two. Those is where I've got numbers to play with. The other thing about this is if you design this yourself, you should absolutely send it off to your board vendors to see that you're designing something they can build. Or you got exotic materials, FR4 is not. If you have exotic materials that has long lead times, you'd get that type of information in there. So if I come in here and I build it, I want to go out and send a technology file or IPC 2581. I still could send an HTML file to them so that they can review what I've built as far as a stack up. If they've done that work for me because I've went to them and I said, hey, I got differential pairs. I want 100 ohms and peens. What layers should I be routing this on and what's aligned with? What's the gap? They're going to feed that information. They're going to create a stack up. I'll just ask them for that stack up, load it in. I don't have to do any of this work. I'm just taking in the IPC 2581 or the cross-section tech file. It has created that stack up for me already. I don't want to do the work that they've already done on there. So then we go in there and we need to 
have our DRC checkups. So if we're going in there, and I'll go to the constraint manager, and the constraint manager for our tool is where uh, I call it the brains of the operation. You're going in there, and you're setting this constraint manager up with all the rules that you're going to have that you want to build to. So up there, we have our electrical rules. We can come in there, our timing, our routing in there. Let's go ahead and expand routing. I've got my wires. All these are my design rules that I'm setting up in there. I got my physical, I got my spacing, I got same net spacing. So if I'm tuning clock nets or differential pairs, I don't want to get too close back on themselves so I can set up spacing for same net. But I jump down here to the manufacturing and here's where I, I'm really happy with what we have here and would have had, loved to have had this years ago. I started out hand taping boards uh, in my career. So you, you went in and checked manually your cell phone. Now you've got the benefit of this software doing it. So I can come in here and I can open this up and I purposely blanked all these numbers out because I had old numbers from years ago. Here are my board manufacturers. I can ask them TTM, Sunstone circuits, Sierra circuits. I can ask them for their rules. Go ahead and give me your rules. Let me put them in there. What I'm able to do now is check my design to the fabricator. There's no reason to send that to them and get this laundry list back of things that you need to fix because it's not meeting their fabrication requirements. Guess what? I no longer want to do prototype boards as a quick turn fast prototype. I want them rules right up front. I've, I've worked at the end of my career where I was doing prototype boards and the next spin was right into manufacturing. There's your savings. There's your time to market is turn that prototype into the next spin being production board. By, by checking to your manufacturer rules, you can do that. It comes in, it gives you the mask annular ring. Annular ring's important, uh, depending on the product you're doing. It all starts with that via, that annular ring. We also give you that same benefit with your assembly houses. So here's four assembly houses on here. Sierra Circuit is also an assembly house, we want to point out. Like I said, these rules will be given to you by the assembly house. There's no reason why you can't come in here then. Uh, the same with the fabrication. You can come in here now and I can click to design. And in my design, I can tell it what assembly house I'm going to be using on here. So I can come in here and decide what that is. Again, the same up here in my designs for the actual fabrication. I can come in here and I can change these rules. I'll say yes, I didn't end my command back here. I can change my rules. Now I've got it set up that I'm checking to their rules, both for the fabrication, both for the assembly. We also give that to you in the actual design for test also. So your test fixture, whether it be a bed of nails test fixture, whether it be a clamshell, which I don't recommend, a bed of nails for top, bed of nails for bottom is cheaper than a clamshell. Whether you're doing fi flying probe, where you're doing scans. But the important thing is you've got that information. You're designing that property. Our software gives them the XY drill information for those pogo pins on a bed and nails tester. Then you need to know whether you're doing crown heads or whether you're doing the spears. Uh, the spears will wear out faster than the crown heads. The crown heads needs a larger pad than the spears. So there's the trade-off that you need to make on your uh, density of your design and how much you're able to uh, probe uh, remember, JTAG's great because you, it lessens the amount of probes that you need to do uh, per net on there. So that's actually designing in. We, we kind of look at this as, and the whole idea was a Valor type check that most board houses will do. They use a Valor tool to do checking. Why not bring that up front to the engineer? Why not have that foremost in the design? Plan on that ahead of time, not as a post processing and then get a laundry list and lead time could be a week or two to re-spin that design. And then you're sending out new documentation for that on that. So the vendor rules are important. Your DRCs are in there and their DRCs are in there. So you're actually checking to that. One other thing that was mentioned that I want to touch on is the fact that uh, your components. So within our schematic tool, we have a database and you create that database. And in that database, you're linking directly to your distributors that you're possibly buying from. You can come right in here to the compliance. 
using silicon expert technology. It's going to tell you in the life. It's going to tell you if they're uh, actually fraud parts. So you can go in there not not wanting to buy. There's a lot of counterfeit parts out there now. So those fraud parts can cost you dearly. Buying them, losing the money on the parts, and then if you have used the parts and they fail on the board, then you've got problems there. So we're bringing this technology in from all these experts out there like Silicon Expert, and you're actually being able to know that the parts that you're calling for are out there, they're available to you, and they're not counterfeit parts on there. You can have it in your bomb, you can have temp parts, engineers can make their temp parts, uh, because remember, in a prototype stage, they could be calling for parts that aren't even in the corporate library yet, but they'll hold there in that temp part until you want to do those final checks on them. So you come back here to your parts manager, and in my parts manager, I'm going to say, okay, I've got approved parts. I know they're good, and here's all my new parts. i got to get out there and get those approved uh, because this is a new design, and I haven't used these parts so I need to go in there and reconcile these parts with the parts manager so that I know when I send that bomb over that they can start buying parts for this board and I have the confidence I know that I can get parts, not only get the parts, but they're not counterfeit parts on there. So as we jump back to the board, I'm going to shift boards, just load this other board to save time. And let's just go ahead and do a, uh, we'll do a fit view here. Now I'm going to go ahead and just jump on out. Here's my fab drawing. It's basically drafting 101. I'm in here on the tool and I'm doing drafting. There are some add-on tools that we have there where you can go out there and you can create all these documentations uh, that it'll do the really the fab drawing. It'll do that in a couple minutes, assembly drawing a couple minutes there, and you can have your drawings done. Without that option, you come in here and use the tool just as a regular old drafting tool. Uh, that's what the CAD systems were in the very beginning, just an old drafting tool that we were using out there. So I want to jump in here and talk about the fab notes. It's important that you know what you're building. It's important to give this information, as much information as you can to that fabricator. So you've got your materials that you're going to be using in there. You've got your specs that you expect it to be designed to. They need to know what class of the product. You need to know what class you're designing. It all starts back at that pad stack, depending on the class of product. Class one, class two, or class three product. Class one product, if it fails, chances are it's going to a landfill if they're in the recycle place for it. Class two product, I mean, that's expensive. You're going to get it repaired. Uh, the motherboard in a car, you wouldn't throw the car away. You'd get that motherboard repaired. Other equipment like that, class two product. Class three product fails. If it fails, the best you can hope to do is send a body bag home. Class three products are important. There's the ITAR. There's the big medical companies. That class three product is very important. You need to know what you're designing. You need to be an intelligent engineer to say, this is what I'm building and convey that information to the fabricator. They need that. The other thing that they need in there is that drill chart. So we need you to go in there and be able to make uh, this drill chart so that they have that. This is what I do. I create an artwork file of the outline. You can see this outline here, and I've got some slots cut into this board here. So I have my outline, and I create an, a Gerber file of just outline. Should my dimensions be wrong? On this system, it's kind of hard because we didn't dimension to an object. But should I make a mistake in my dimensioning or not have a dimension out there that's missing that would hold them up? They can take that artwork file. And in my fab notes, I'd say if dimensioning's discrepancy exists, use the artwork file for the outline and the cutouts on there. The other thing I like to do, drilling is the gate. Don't misunderstand that. The gate at any fabricator is that drilling process. Uh, you heard Steve talk about uh, you can't drill fast in some of that high-end material because of the heat. The other thing I want to uh, point out is I go in there on let's say the mounting holes or tooling holes, and I'll go ahead and put the plus symbol in there and its actual size of that drill. Now, if they make a Gerber file of this artwork and they can lay it on that blank panel that they're going to run through first time checking the drills, they can literally just lay this right on top of that panel and do a quick visual check to make sure there's no issues with the drilling in there. 
again, it's the gate. Do any and everything you can to help them out. They need to stack up and they need to know what that material is. I like to run my materials. I like to go ahead and give the dimensions in there the, and the type of material that I'm using here, FR4. Uh, that stack up's important on that. So as I jump back out of here, then I want to go ahead and jump over here to uh, show the visibility of the next layer. So the next fab drawing layer. So all those slots I needed to dimension out and I need to do details of those. Again, this is drafting 101. I need to create those details. I need to show them what's happening with this board. Why all those slots in there? Because they needed to stay at FR4, FR4 material to stay at the cost factor they needed to make the product available. Uh, otherwise, they were going to lose money on it if they didn't. But guess what? They were having voltage creepage across that FR4. So what we do, we went in there and cut moats, literally a slot in the board to stop at. They passed uh, UL high pot test. They passed BDE requirements. It's not a problem now selling this product over in Europe. Those are the type of things you need to knew, know and build into your design. And that's what we were doing with these slots. Again, the fabricator needs to know this. We can't have hiccups at the end on there. So if there was a dimension here that was wrong, they could always go back to the artwork file with these cutouts with the board outline on there. Apart from that, then let's just go ahead and jump to our an assembly drawing because we need an assembly drawing on there. And I like to try to make one, uh, one assembly drawing if I can, if it's clear enough to go in there and see, I can put top and bottom assembly on the same page but also create a Gerber file of this. So if they wanted to, they could take that, create that artwork from that Gerber file and lay that down, see if there's parts missing. If it's basically on the back side, it'd be easy. On the top, there's some pretty uh, high parts there. But it allows a checking process for them if they want to take that type of checking, a visual. You're on the, the assembly line out there. I want to check that. I want to just take that artwork and lay right over, do a quick visual check on that. So over here on the side, you'll see our manufacturing prep area. We also have the PCB basically follow all the way through. I can jump into my manufacturing and then I can open that up, the different things I need. IPC 2581 is the same as ODB++. It's not widely accepted, but IPC decided that no one should be held hostage at getting their uh, information out of their design. ODB++ is proprietary software they could start charging to use that to extract out data. The very engineers that developed ODB++ went over to IPC and helped them develop the 2581. So you've got one in the same in there. It's just a matter of what your fabricator uses. More and more has moved over to the IPC and the council has created this so that no one is held hostage again for their data in there. This is a step down uh, basically in our tool. Just go down through here. You can then open it up and, and it's a step down process, checkoff list if you want, how to get the information and the information that they need over to that fabricator, over to that assembly house, over to that test house. Okay, Samantha, back to you. Thank you, Orlin. At this time, I would like to open the floor for the Q&A. The first question is, do you have design rule files that you share with customers so your customers always have the correct slash optimal design rules. So I can take that one, uh, Samantha or Lucy. Um, so the short answer is yes, we do, but more so we have actually integrated them into our into our online tools. So, you know, rather than kind of print them out and say, hey, here's a list of all of our DRCs, you can actually upload your design and it'll do that real time. But if there is a requirement, then we can get the system to, you know, print out a list of our, you know, our, our design requirements or our manufacturing capabilities. So short answer is yes, that's available. Thank you. And the next question is, do you prefer certain formats for manufacturing data? Again, the answer is is yes, but it depends on which part of the process we're speaking about. So, you know, is it the actual fabrication of the circuit boards or is it open assembly? Uh, you know, the truth of the situation is that we can handle all data sets. We, you know, whether it's ODB++, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's older type of data, 
RS, you know, two, three, two type data, we can handle all formats, but there is preferred formats that we, uh, that we do uh, like, which is, you know, either the latest IPC or uh, ODB++, for, for example. But what we can do there is we can follow up with a list of all of our, all of our um, approved data formats and we can put them in some kind of an order of precedence and we can make that available to the participants after the webinar. Another question is, please explain ESG risk. Okay, so within our supply chain, um, you know, we, we measure a number of different things, you know, all of the different risks, whether it be financial or not. You know, we team up with some external bodies, um, you know, there's some commercial uh, solutions out there, such as risk methods and things like that. Um, but we, we look at all the different types of risks. And when it comes to things like, you know, social governance and things like this, then, you know, really it's about, you know, brand reputation, brand damage. So within supply chain, we obviously, when we're making our vendor appraisal and assessment, we're, we're looking for companies, right, that, you know, are minority owned and, you know, are meeting certain types of requirements and criteria. But we also have, you know, some external services that are constantly looking at all of the organizations that we engage with, you know, and they're making sure that they have active um, processes in place, you know, to cover things such as, you know, social governance and things like this. So it's a mixture of our in-house processes and protocols, uh, commercial software, right, which is evaluating our vendors and our customers, right, to, you know, look for any, anything untoward that might be coming through. Um, and then obviously just following your know, best practices where we can. Thank you. And this question is directed to Orlin. Um, that workflow you had on the left, could you explain more about that? Yeah, very good question. This workflow here, uh, if you go to our EMA uh, store, we have a store, that's a program, it's a, like I was talking about earlier, the skill program. And it's a program that we built to actually bring this in. Uh, it's considered third party, but it fits right into your software. You can download that, it's free of charge. So go to the store, sign in, download that. It gives you the design workflow uh, for our actual manufacturing prep, and you'll get all these pull downs linking the commands right to it. So if I'm here and I wanna go to the IPC 2581, it pops you me right there instantly i'm there deciding what i want to send out what release i want to send out the prototype a b or c that c's just been released out and you'll have all that information out there uh, anything that you would see after tools and between help within the cad system is either programs that we wrote we being ema or programs you yourself as a user can write. It's open architectural, that's the thing that, that makes this system so robust, is the fact that you can write your own, you'll have your own tabs in there, uh, and pull downs and your skill programs will be available for you. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. And closing off with the last question, can Sierra Circuits program programmable parts or any functional testing? So, yes and yes. Um, so the functional testing, um, you know, we can do some basic functional tests, but a lot of the time we ask the customer to provide either the schematics for the test rig so we can build one, or if they have a test rig, please send it to us. Um, if there is no functional test rig available, then, um, you know, the best we can do is probably generate a, um, a bed of nails or possibly a probe um you know with a with a um uh, isolation and continuity test but yeah we can uh, and as for the programming of, of of the chips um we have a supplier that does that for us so we don't have the programmable um equipment in-house um but one of our supply chain partners can you know flash you know chips and things like that for us um and it's a it's a local company so we do have the capability but it's not in-house Thank you again to the presenters on today's topic. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. However, if anyone has questions that were not addressed during the webinar, we will be following up with you on an individual basis. I will be closing the webinar now and we will be sending everyone a recorded version of today's webinar with the slide deck within the next few days. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thanks.